this week on the Back Table Podcast. If you take care of a patient with a broken back and you have fixed that patient and their pain has gone away and they've gone back to their normal routine life, I tell my trainees that next time they get a niggle in their back, the first phone call is going to come to you. So that's how much they trust you if you have done your job and you have really helped them. And that's that's the joy in this whole process is that someone who was pretty much assigned to the bed or a recliner, they got up and they're back to their lifestyle within a few weeks of what you have done for that patient. So... Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable MSK podcast, your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Stryker's interventional spine business offers the control you need, the flexibility you want, and the quality your patients deserve. Stryker is your partner in making healthcare better. From technology to training, from reimbursement tools to patient education, Stryker is there to support you every step of the way. Innovation is the driving force at Stryker. Their extensive product portfolio for vertebral augmentation and radiofrequency ablation procedures ensures that you have the tools needed to provide top-notch care. But their commitment to advancement doesn't stop there. With recent additions like the Optoblate Bone Tumor Ablation System, an FDA 510K clearance for the spine jack system for compression fractures that result from malignant lesions, myeloma, or osteolytic metastasis, you'll be eager to explore all the solutions Stryker has to offer. Learn more at www.strikerivs.com. Now, back to the show. This is Dana Dunleavy, interventional radiologist from Buffalo, New York. My great, great pleasure to be with Majid Khan now at Johns Hopkins. And one of our opportunities here, you know, we've had Dr. Khan in the past discussing his expertise on various aspects of spine intervention, but particularly microwave ablation in the past. And tonight, talking about career in academics and particularly with spine intervention and some of the opportunities there. Dr. Khan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your training? Oh, thank you, Dennis. Really appreciate to be here and talking to you guys uh, and back table about my journey. So it all started out in India when I did my medical school. Then I came up to New York and did my residency and then moved on to Baltimore Hopkins for my neuroradiology fellowship. After that, I ended up in University of Mississippi where I had actually gone to get my visa sponsored to, uh, and then get a green card. So I was there for about 10 years at the university. And that's where really where I got into the spine practice, the non-vascular spine practice. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, how, how it came forth. And then after that, moved to Hopkins to set up a spine interventional practice at Hopkins. And after I set it up there, due to some personal reason, family reasons. I moved to Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson, two years, moving back to Johns Hopkins, where I am presently as a shared professor of radiology or the learning biology. Wonderful. And even starting at the beginning, tell us a little bit, what does MBBS mean? This is uh, the British system, like in the American system, once you do your residency and all, you become automatically an MD. In the British system, it's different. When you finish your medical school, you get awarded this uh, MBBS, which is Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. And then because after that, you do your specialization, whichever branch you want to do, and then you get your formal MD, so your MBBS slash and MD there. And then tell us a little bit about your training, because each of us that have really focused in interventional spine have had something special along the way that has helped us get a little bit beyond what the standard residency and fellowship offers. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, when we started out back in the day, there was there was not much spine interventional per se happening. So I was really fortunate enough 
that I was training at Hopkins. I was doing diagnostic neuroradiology fellowship. And then I had the privilege of working with the great Karen Murphy and Philip Gayou at Hopkins. Karen, as you know, was one of the few physicians back then. I did my fellowship in 2002, 2003. So that's when Karen was doing uh, uh, working with augmentation and he was doing intervention. Really, there were only few across the country that were doing it that time. There are still few doing it. I would really have liked more guys to do it, but it's much, much better than what it was. So having trained with Karen, I had a good idea about the basic principles. I had the what we call as the golden rules down very nicely working with him on, on, uh, on cases. But after finishing my fellowship, I didn't, I didn't really do a lot of spine intervention. It was mostly vascular intervention that I was doing. I actually started to do non-vascular spine intervention somewhere around 2011, 2012. So that's, that's when, when I was at University of Mississippi, neurosurgery was coming into the vascular neuro IR realm. And uh, at that point, we, we thought about, let's do, because there was a lot of oncology happening, a lot of oncological fractures happening. And that's when I just thought that, okay, let me, let me just see if I can develop this practice uh, of non-vascular spine. And as all of us who do it regularly, you, me, all the other guys like Jack, Doug, then all of us have pretty much self-trained ourselves, really, so to say. Yes, we had a basic training, but it was really getting trained on the job, doing the cases, uh, and then just gaining in confidence and then starting to do newer and newer procedures. Learning from our uh, pain colleagues, I spent some time with them because they they have formal fellowships in pain, and it was mostly back in that day. It was mostly basic procedures that were being done, but still they had a formal training. So spending some time with them was really helpful. But I would say that really self trained, self trained myself, and started doing these procedures more and more. And then with each passing day, with each procedure, gained an experience. This is where most of us are at now. And I think now, I think really, I feel like it is time for most of us to actually start a spine intervention fellowship and have it as a separate fellowship. Because I see a niche for this now. Most of the programs, be it university hospitals, be it private practices, bigger private practices. I get so many calls from private practice groups, hey, do you have a fellow who's interested in spine procedures? We really want to hire someone who can do spine procedures. So I think at a point now that it has its own niche, it has its own requirement, and it's time to think that starting a formal fellowship at most academic centers where a good number of these procedures are being done the whole gamut of procedures, spine procedures are being done where we can really train our newer trainees so that they can do a better job. Right. You hit on some really critical things. So I just wanted to go back to a couple points. And, you know, one is I think we all accept that you are a legend in this field. No matter where I go across the country, people talk even back in your days in Mississippi about the things that you were doing there and how you innovated the field and, and really changed it. And what I love that you addressed right there are two things. You know, one, that we really have to focus on how we create more ability for this to be widespread throughout all regions so that, you know, patients aren't only limited to places like Johns Hopkins, where you are. The second thing I think that you nicely put is there's so much to gain from multidisciplinary observation, right? And I learn from the pain colleagues all the time, just like you said. Do you want to touch on both of those a little bit more? Absolutely. As, as you said, multidisciplinary approach is a must. So let's even go further back. Like once, let's say we have a resident who is in his fourth year and who is looking for a fellowship and has interest in spine intervention. So how can he or she hone down on a program or on 
their skill set and improve their skill set so when they are trained as a fellow, they can go out there, be it academic hospital or be it a private practice and start their spine interventional program. So first and foremost, I think, as, as I said, alluded to earlier, now we are at a point that we have certain people at university hospitals and even in some pride practices like Doug, Doug a good friend of ours is probably the best example of this, that he has already a formal fellowship in place in a private practice setting. I think most of us now who are doing good volume of spinal torrential cases at university hospitals ought to start this fellowship where we can get these residents who have interest in spinal torrential program and get them in and train them. And it's not only the procedural skills that they want, because it's a, especially talking from a radiology point of view, it's ingrained in our minds if you're a diagnostic radiologist, particularly interventional radiology has definitely changed a lot over the years now. If you are a diagnostic radiology and you want to do some kind of a hybrid work, you want to do part interventional and part diagnostic, first and foremost, you have to change your mindset that the days of doing procedure only and then not owning that patient are completely over and gone. You may be a proceduralist who does the procedure, but previously we used to do the procedure and then we didn't know anything about the patient, what happened to the patient. We can't do that anymore. You have to own the patient. You have to have a set routine where you evaluate your patient before the procedure and you can evaluate the, procedure, or the patient after the procedure, the post-procedural care, and follow up the patient because any complication that happens with the patient is pretty much your complication and you have to take care of that. So, so that mindset, I feel like that's very important to ingrain in our trainees now is that you are not just going to do the procedure and be done with the patient. And once that mindset comes in, and as I said, that can be only seen once they are in a place where you have a set routine, you're doing the pre-evaluation, you're following up your patient for a set period of time, be it two months, six months, one year out, however you are doing it, each place has different different criteria. And once they see that, they have clinic evaluation, they tend to see that and they say, okay, no, this is different. This is different now. I'm not just doing a procedure. I have to take care of the patient also. A simple example that we talked about so much on social media and er everywhere. So osteoporosis, you get these osteoporotic fractures. If we just go and treat that fracture with augmentation and do not take care of the basic problem of osteoporosis, especially having talked to the patient and knowing from the patient that he or she has not been treated by any endocrinologist, they have not had DEXA scans. And after knowing all this information from our clinic talk with them and then just treating the fracture and letting go of that patient really in this day and age is criminal. Either you treat the osteoporosis yourself, get treated, or the easiest way out is that refer the patient to an endocrinologist who can take care of patient. Least you can do for that patient is get a DEXA scan if they have not. How many patients have you and I seen in this day and age who say that they have absolutely no idea, no one talked to them about osteoporosis, they have no idea what DEXA scan is, and they are doubled up, they have had five or six fractures already, and still they're not on medication for osteoporosis. So that's the kind of mindset that has to be instilled in our trainees that it's not just the procedural part of it. it's a 360 about the patient that we have to take care of. We have to think like our clinical colleagues think when they when they get a patient. Yeah. And I think, you know, to go with that, you know, you mentioned Doug's fellowship and clearly the trainees come out really prepared clinically and technically. And to your point, one of those examples, right, the patient comes in with the STEMI and you treat their coronary artery disease hopefully they're going to leave on appropriate antiplatelet therapy. And I think that happens consistently. But what we see 
is we understand the morbidity and mortality implications of a vertebral compression fracture or a fragility fracture of the hip, and yet the majority of our patients never get treated for their osteoporosis. Absolutely. And our good friend Josh has published published that paper that's very critical about that and, and really shows what you were talking about, that how important this it is to treat these fractures to save a life. Yeah. And then I think to your point, just to get back to the focus training of interventional spine that you do, if we compare, you know, I think some of our colleagues don't realize that anesthesia and PM and R have a specific fellowship for spine and pain, whereas a lot of what we are doing is very broad, very broad and quite challenging to kind of hone your skills in the spine. So are you thinking of something more focused? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because what I'm thinking is is global. I don't want to be in this niche that my trainee is just going to stay with me in radiology. I really want them to go out and spend a month with our pain guys, see or a month and a half with our pain guys, see how they're doing. At Hopkins, we already have pain fellows rotate with me in my lab and they come in and see what I'm doing. So hopefully once once we get this fellowship started, I want our fellows to go out with them and train with them because there are certain things that they are doing much better than we are doing. And to get a real 360 training for our trainees, it's very important to learn from people who do good number of cases, not like few cases in a month. So like pain injections, spinal cord stimulators, I know many of our radiology colleagues are doing, but we are not doing that at Hopkins. So that's something that I would want my trainees to get training in. Our pain guys are doing a whole lot of that. So kind of have a combination with our pain people, PMRR people, and involve them in the fellowship and even take their fellows and train their fellows because really, end of the day, we want people to do non-vascular spinal interventional procedures to help patients out. I think, I think that should be the key. It should not be that, hey, is radiology getting the patient? Is pain medicine getting the patient? PMRR getting the patient? You really have to have that mindset that what is good for the patient and am I doing what is, what is really good for the patient? Really, you would want something for your patient which you would want for your mother, father, or your relatives. We have to think like that. And if I'm not comfortable enough in doing the procedure, I should have no hesitation in referring that patient to my, so to say, competition in down in pain medicine or PM and or knowing that they can do it much better than me. So same way, so sending our trainees there or getting their trainees to us, that's how it should be, really. That's how I envision it should be, for proper and better training. And one of the things I think a lot of trainees don't realize is when you're at Hopkins or you're at Thomas Jefferson, you think that's the way the world is. But as you noted, it's wonderful that you're giving your trainees the expertise of multiple specialties because if you end up like me out in a more rural community, you are doing neuromodulation and you are doing sacroiliac joint dysfunction and you are doing bone tumor ablation. So you really need all of those skills that at a place like Hopkins might be across multiple departments. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. And I tell this to my trainees every single day that being in an academic center, we are in a very protected environment. We know that this person A does this better, person B does this better, person C does this better, and, and you can send your patients out those ways. But when you are out in private practice, you are the person A, B, and C. And, and that's why it is very important for you to have proper training in doing those procedures because you are in there, in a, especially in a smaller practice. In the bigger practices now, we see that people have different issues. Smaller practices, it's just like you said, that you're doing everything, and which is, which is really great. I wish I could do that, but that's how it is. At university hospitals, there are some constraints, and you have to follow those constraints to have your referral stream going. It's a different world, private practice versus university academic centers. Now, one of the things that can be challenging is what we call what we do, right? And 
as you noted, we're trying to focus on improved access for these patients across the whole country. And it's wonderful to hear, again, leaders like yourself and Jack saying, it's, it's not about what I do, right? It's about how do we improve access consistently across all regions. Now, when we look at the fastest growing area of interventional radiology or SIR, it's, you know, in the area we call musculoskeletal interventions. But I'm curious, what would you call the fellowship and how do you think we clarify that? It's simple is to just keep it non-vascular spine interventional fellowship. Don't give it any name of, will it be run by MSK? Will it be run by neuroradiology? Will it be run by interventional radiology? Just just call it non-vascular spine interventional fellowship. And as I said, that there are hospitals, MSK is doing 50%, Neuro is doing 50%, MSK is doing 90%. Like in Jack's hospital, Jack probably Jack is doing 80%, Neuro is doing 20%. At our hospital, it's, it's 80% us in Neuro slash IR, and MSK is doing 10, 15%. So all hospitals have different dynamics. So rather than that, putting in those categories that who will lead this, just take that completely out and straight and simple, non-vascular spine intervention. Now, since you don't always do what you're told to do, because I know that you're capable of always doing what is best for patients and trainees, I'll ask you a difficult question, which you can skip. Should this be part of radiology or separate from radiology? <laughs> As I said, I think I already alluded to the for this. Definitely being part of interventional radiology is better because of the mindset to own the patient and all that. And I have seen over the years now, interventional radiology has completely changed and, and the trainees in interventional radiology definitely have imbibed that mindset. Diagnostic radiology is still not really on board with that because some of them still think that they have called in to do the procedure, they did the procedure, sent the patient back to their referral source, and that's it. That's the end of it. But as I said, that if we could imbibe that characteristic into our diagnostic or sl slash, I should say, hybrid interventionalist who want to do some diagnostic work, but they have to imbibe this mindset that, hey, I have to have a clinic. Take, for example, when I came to Hopkins from University of Mississippi, Hopkins did not have a spine intervention. So what did I do to set this up? When I interviewed, first thing that I told them was, hey, I need a clinic. You can give me initially half a day clinic in a week uh, as my practice builds up. Definitely, we can, we can increase the clinic days. So, But clinic is a must. I asked for a nurse practitioner or a PA because you really cannot survive especially because I wanted to do diagnostic work also because I, I really had to build a practice from scratch. So you can't, you can't just come in and give full time to building practice without, in this day and age, you have to be realistic. Our views matter. So our views have to come from somewhere, be it in prior practice or in academic medicine. So that's how I started it. And, and they said, okay, we'll give you a clinic. You will share right now as your practice builds up. You will share person A's nurse practitioner or PA. And as you build your practice, as we see your practice grow, you can later on have your own uh, NP and PA. So that, that's, that's very important. So that, that, was, that was one thing. Then if you're like a hybrid, you just have to have a set time. So it's 50%. Interventional 50% diagnostic. Have a talk with your potential recruiter or chairman or in private practice, your your boss. So you should have set that as the practice builds up, you, you may start with 30%, but you will move on to 50% as the practice builds up. So this should be this should be clear in your thoughts and the, the chair who is hiring you should should know this. Then really in my initial interview, although I was part of radiology, diagnostic radiology also. I really wanted to be have interviews with neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, radiation oncology, medical oncology. That was something that I really asked for, for my interviews, that I, I really want to talk to these guys. So they all arranged that. So I, I got to talk to neurosurgery because you can really gauge talking to those guys that how much interest is in the hospital or in the practice to refer you patients, how much help do they want 
is neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, doing most of these procedures on their own, you get to know that. So you, you kind of get a feel for the turf, that where exactly your patients are coming from. So you, you're, you're trying to feel that out. With the pathologic fractures, now we know, really, I say that radiation oncologists are really the quarterbacks. They send the patient out in different directions, be it surgery, be it interventional, or radiation is do done for all, all patients based on your SIN score and everything. So really, you have to be friends with your radiation oncologists. They have to come on board with what you're trying to do. And I think it's very important. So having had that, then I came in and I probably the first six months, I must have given at least 10, 12 grand rounds across the board, all these different specialties, telling them, hey, what I'm bringing to the plate. You'll be surprised that, although we say that, hey, ablations, vertebral plasties, stimulators, SI joint infusion, blah, blah, blah. You'll be surprised that how many APPs or our advanced practitioners who help us, PAs and NPs, have no clue. How many times I, have I heard, I'm sure you have also heard, that nurse practitioner or, or, or a PA say, oh, really, fractures can be treated with cement, kyphoplasty, what is that? So really going out there, talking to them, giving them grand rounds, geriatrics is, is, a, is a big referral source at every hospital. Going to them, talking to them, telling them, hey, this modality can help patients. And you'll be very surprised at how patients start coming in once you, once you go to them, talk to them, what you can offer. So did that. And then finally, really, it's, it's your work that has to speak up. Patients, you get the patients, patients feel better, you follow your patients, they get that trust in you that, hey, we are, we are referring him to patients and he's taking care of our patients. He is following on his patients. If a complication happens, he is taking care of that complication rather than dumping that patient on us and having us figure out what to do next for whatever complication has happened. You beg, borrow, or steal, you take care of your complication. Talk to your colleague. That's why you need your surgery, friends in your surgery. You need orthopedic surgery as your friends. You need hospitalists as your friends so that you can have admitting privileges. You can ask those guys to help you out in times of need. So these are, these are little things, but they matter a lot as, as you are developing your practice. And, you know, I think there's two things to uh, separate here. One is the growth of your practice. For instance, I mean, you have really developed an incredibly high-end, nationally recognized non-vascular spine program. And then there's also promotion within academics. Two different goals, maybe they come together. But, you know, one thing that I wonder about is the willingness to accept some challenges when you're looking to grow a practice in academics and be promoted in academics. And you mentioned, you know, Karen Murphy back in my day, right? There were Murphy needles, there was Murphy cement. We gained tremendous amount of knowledge from him. And then he, he moved and was promoted to another practice. Similarly, Dr. Khan, you know, was promoted to out of Hopkins and then promoted again back to Hopkins. And even if we discuss, you know, your wife, you know, I mean, you have to find a role for her. And obviously she's capable of doing that herself, but, you know, you don't want to harm your family in the process of that promotion as well. How have you handled that? Absolutely. Uh, it's hard work. It's really hard work. I tell you, for six months that I came when I went to Hopkins or for that matter, when I went to Jefferson to develop this exactly same practice up at Jefferson, it takes a toll on you because you're really busy for six months trying to talk to the physicians, as I said, and giving these grand rounds, giving these talks and talking to them. It does, it does definitely take a lot of your time, but if you have passion for this, I think, I think it's very much doable. You just have to have your heart in this. You have to really enjoy what you're doing, helping patients out. There's really joy in that if you take care of a patient with a broken back, 
and you have fixed that patient and their pain has gone away and they've gone back to their normal routine life. I tell my trainees that next time they get a niggle in their back, the first phone call is going to come to you. So that's how much they trust you if you have done your job and you have really helped them. And that's that's the joy in this whole process is that someone who was pretty much assigned to the bed or a recliner, they got up and they're back to their lifestyle within a few weeks of what you have done for that patient. So granted, sometimes it doesn't work, but most of the time I feel like it works and, and that's what keeps us going. And, and finding better and less invasive procedures to help these patients out. So we, in, in short, really, you have to have passion for this. You have to enjoy what you're doing. If you feel burdened by it, then it, it's, it's not going to happen. I was out giving some didactics and labs last week with both pain and interventional radiologists, and, and one of the uh, attendees there was telling me about his experience at Johns Hopkins and the mentorship of our friend Dave Usum, who oftentimes gives instructions about how to succeed in an academic career. And not everyone agrees with his philosophy, but certainly he's been very successful and it definitely works. The question is, how do you see the success in academics? It takes a toll on you, really. And, and, and you mentioned Dave, and if you look at what Dave has done, he's like a superhero. To this day, he's, he's just like that, how he was probably 20 years ago. But I have seen Dave in my fellowship, how hard he has worked. His days would begin at 6 and they would end at around 8 or 9 p.m. I guess those were the days of the giants. I don't, I don't really see people doing that. I myself can, can do that. But to be successful in in your academic career, both clinically as well as in, in research, it's really an uphill task. And in this day and age, you really, I, I think that if you really want to carry both of these together, you will have to spend your personal time also. And this is not a eight to five kind of a job that you can carry both these research as well as your clinical acumen forward in the eight to five kind of mindset. It definitely takes a toll on your personal time. It definitely takes a lot of weekends, writing papers, writing grants, but it's universities are changing now. And it's, it's a good thing that I'm seeing now. That's a definite change that I'm seeing in universities. Now universities have kind of sort of realized this, that, Hey, we need to have two pathways. One is a clinical excellence pathway, and one is the research and development pathway and all that. And so whichever pathway you choose to get better at in a university hospital, you can choose that pathway. This was not available back in the day when we were young and we were trying to choose what we wanted to do. We really pretty much in an academic setting, you had to carry both of them together. But now things have changed, and I feel for the better, and people who want more clinical exposure and want to do more better in a clinical setting rather than a research setting do have that opportunity. With some people, I'm not saying that no one can do it. There are people, there are people in our university that are carrying both of these together, but again, cannot be done with that eight to five mindset. Now, I've had the pleasure of, you know, being on Spine Innovation Councils with people like you and Jack and Doug and Sean and Wayne, and always exciting to see even what's going on in your mind. And some of this stuff, when we think about, for instance, Jack's studies on sheep models with different modalities, just to get into the details a little bit on, you know, long ablations in the posterior third of the vertebral body with different modalities. People are always in awe about the work you've done with microwave ablation. What are your thoughts now on doing some of those cases? Is that something that everyone can do or Majid can do? Absolutely. No, everyone. That's what I'm saying. It's The technology is up there now. Yes, initially there were some issues, but now there are so many companies out there that have microwave ablations and probes, and it's really user-friendly now. It's not 
something to be scared of as we used to be scared of microwave. You can control how you heat up the tissue, how fast you can do it, and how the temperature you can control is much better now with the newer companies coming in. And as we speak, uh, there are at least two or three more companies that I know of are getting into the microwave business who were previously not had any microwave uh, business. So people are definitely getting into it. And I see definitely more and more people doing microwave ablation of the bone compared to, say, five years ago. So definitely, it's, it's, it's really good to have that on your shelf. Uh, especially for sclerotic metastases, although granted, RFA has gotten better now with mixed density and even sclerotic metastases, but still, microwave, I think, is is definitely has an advantage in those. And to answer your question, really, it's much easier now what it used to be, absolutely. When I started Definitely, there were some challenges that we were feeling. And now with, with all these other thermocouplers available and all other things that we use, hydro dissection, carbon dioxide, and all that, those are all very helpful to safeguard your spinal cord, spinal canal nerves. So that's that's also added advantageous that you have. That's a great point. So, you know, I think you've educated people that if we were to simplify it, and you could correct me if I go wrong here, that many lytic metastases would be treated with RF, sclerotic, with microwave, and soft tissue with cryo as an overall generalization. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And, you know, again, some of the very brave leaders like Dave Prologo published an article about some of the cryo work he did of the acetabulum and, and some associated morbidity that comes from, for instance, an avascular necrosis of the femoral head. How do you see that risk-benefit balance you know, when RF has that impedance with cortex that we don't necessarily have with cryo or microwave? Uh, Especially like if you're doing pelvic tumors, definitely you can use microwave because you're not as much worried about your neural structures as you are when you're doing your vortices. Most of the microwave probes that are being used give you about five to six centimeter of target burn zone. And and that's something that can be utilized very nicely, especially with with pelvic tumors that I have have done. It's very easy and very fast rather than doing with the radio frequency ablation where you can't get like a six centimeter or eight centimeter uh, burn zone. With uh, Cryo, multiple papers have come out of cryo and bone. So people have been doing this, uh, as you said. David Perogo is doing it. Good friend Jay Morris uh, up in Mayo, he does a lot of uh, cryo in bone also. And the good thing that I like about cryo is that it is more forgiving than the thermal modalities that we used, even if you come close to a nerve or there is still a good chance that uh, your nerve may regain back its function with cryo compared to a microwave or a radio frequency. Thermal thermal ablations are are definitely less forgiving compared to cryo. And then do you use weight bearing in that algorithm? For instance, you know, if you're going to be thinking about the cement and structural support after ablation, does that come into play for you? And if so, do you have kind of a timeline of how long you let each modality cool before administering? The golden rule really is that if you are doing a weight bearing bound, you have to have a plan for putting cement there. And usually if I do, be it a microwave or RSA, after my burn, I, I usually wait about five, seven minutes before I start to put cement in for that cavity to just cool off. I've seen people put cement right away, and I don't think there are any papers out there that, hey, if you put it like real fast, there is leakage of the cement, it just liquefies and all that. I haven't seen that. But it's it's like all of us have our own idiosyncrasies, I, I would say. And I, I feel like that it makes me feel better that if I wait five, seven minutes just for that cavity to cool off before I start putting cement in that cavity. But the golden rule is that 
if it's a weight bearing bone, you have to put cement. Uh, non weight bearing iliacs and all I have done where we just did ablation, didn't have any need to put cement in. But weight weight bearing, especially vertebras, absolutely have to put cement after you after you ablate them. And for you, are you talking about five minutes after microwave or with all modalities? All terminal modalities that I do. Based on temperature or time? That's a good question. So usually I don't go over 85 degrees, be it microwave or RFA. Uh, saving five, five minutes doesn't, is not a big deal for me. I feel in my mind that 85 is the max that I go with. If that increases my time of burn by five minutes, so be it. So uh, that's, that's how I, how I feel like it. But having said that, neural Injury happens at 40 degrees centigrade, so 85 is still double the temperature, but it's something, again, that, that's in my mind. It doesn't have any, any, any basis that, hey, I go to 95 versus 85, I really don't feel there's much difference, but I, I just typically keep it at 85. And do you measure temperatures following the ablation to determine normalization before cement administration? No, it's not really. Sounds good. No, another mini tangent uh, before I let you go. Clearly, you're talking about many modalities and many different vendors. And I think that while you do so much education, clearly you're focused on what is the best for each particular patient. And from that, you know, you're clearly doing a lot of work in different types of mechanical augmentation or, you know, even your work now with three column support. What are your latest thoughts? I know you're publishing on this in terms of both osteoporotic fractures and reducing adjacent level with three column support or whether this also provides benefit for pathologic fractures? For the mechanical or implant augmentation, I really think that all of us sort of agree that if you feel like that height restoration needs to be achieved, then really I think the answer to that question is that Spine Jack is probably the best available implant on the market right now that will get you height restoration, consistent height restoration. Definitely, there are there are others also. Kiva is there that I have used that can also get you height restoration. But I feel like that Spine Jack is very consistent with that. And we recently published a paper uh, that came out in AJNR in which again it. We compared vertebroplasty to balloon kyphoplasty to uh, implant. Spine Jack proved that consistently better height restoration, local kyphotic angle correction, and all that. So I think that's a definite advantage of Spine Jack when you want height restoration. So when initially Spine Jack came out, we're using Spine Jacks in also any kind of fracture. It really took me about six months to realize that, hey, what am I doing with spine jack? Uh, and where should I be using spine jack? And then now in my practice, I will use spine jack only in moderate to severe compression vertebras. I, I literally seek out vertebral planus if I can fit a spine jack in to raise the height of that vertebra. Then you asked about the posterior augmentation, posterior and anterior augmentation with the V-strut device that is out there. I think that's a great device to have in your lab. It is definitely, especially in severely osteoporotic patients, it's very useful because we know that the studies we just actually have just put in our first experience, U.S. experience with V-strut uh, with uh, Reed DeLisi up in uh, Mount Sinai. So hopefully, hopefully that paper will come out in a couple of months. And it really, it's helping with anterior and posterior augmentation, and it balances out the weight-bearing forces, the axial weight-bearing between the vertebral body and the posterior element. That's very helpful in that. I, I honestly feel that V-strut has a niche, especially in pathologic fractures, where you have tumor that has involved uh, pedicles. And uh, there are many instances where we really do augmentation surgeries for some reason is not being done, whatever that reason be. Maybe it's diffusely metastatic disease or for other reasons where, and the pedicles are involved. And if I am asked to do an augmentation of a, such a patient, I would definitely do 
a V strut and put the strut in so that I can augment both the anterior as well as the posterior column inside the fish. So just to uh, clarify for the audience, you're not talking about anterior and posterior aspect of the vertebral body. Yeah. Right. So columns. And one of the things that you probably could tease out a little bit more, oftentimes people have tremendous concern about any involvement of the pedicle, one where they should ablate if they should access at all. So does it give you any concern that you're not only going through that involved pedicle, but you're leaving an implant behind within that pedicle? That's a very good question. So like when we put cement in, say, for example, in a spine jack, you have an osteoporotic compression fracture and you're putting cement in that bone. The, one of the advantages that spine jack gives you that the amount of cement that you put in is much less compared to a balloon kyphoplasty that would have been put in if you were doing that. And so that decreases the chances of extracts. But if you are putting spine jack in a pathologic fracture now, you cannot get away with putting just that 2cc of cement that you would have gotten away with in putting in an osteoporotic bone. Because then in, a, in an osteoporotic bone, the job of the cement is to just cement the, the, the implant in place. While as in a tumor, you really, even though you have achieved height restoration in a pathological fracture or whatever you were trying to do with that, you really have to dump as much cement as you can in a pathologic fracture because if you put just your two regular two cc's of contrast, the implant can bend over, fall, because it's tumor. So if the tumor spreads back along the posterior aspect, it can do... I had actually had one patient where it completely bent over and fell down. So you really have to put a lot of cement in that. And I think same philosophy for... We struck. If you're doing in a pedicle that has been completely destroyed, uh, you definitely you definitely either do a pediculoplasty. But if you have put good bit of cement along the anterior aspect of your implant, that will still hold the implant in place, and you can get away with not doing uh, pedicle cement. And so, you know, one way of looking at that, you can correct me on this, is that in a large destructive lytic metastasis, more structure and more cement is helpful. Absolutely. 100%. Any thoughts as we're in this detailed section on steerability of certain devices, you know, particularly the posterior third, central aspect of the vertebral body, as well as the differences in cement? Cement, I think that's where we are sort of kind of lagging behind still. PMMA, we started out with what, probably 1993 when vertebroplasty uh, when first was done in the United States. We used PMMA, and to this day, we are using PMMA. The only thing I really think that has changed over all these years is probably the viscosity. <laughs> so it, it has become more viscous. We put one company says this is ours is more viscous than the other company. Some put a little barium beads in there that, hey, it's better better seen and so. But the idea is that that's what we are trying to play with, but the basic structure of PMMA is still there and that's what we're using. And hopefully, I'm really hoping that we would at least try to move away and, and, and look at other cements. I know with Gribo, uh, a lot of New cements have been devised and have been worked in, especially in animal models and all that. Nothing has come to the fore, but I'm pretty sure that there's there's uh, one company that actually you sent me the text the other day, and I had met that company uh, in ASSR, and they have these uh, osteointegrative cement beads that you can put in the vertebra that over a period of six to eight months osteointegrate with the bone and it's not as heavy as PMMA. So hopefully that company has come out in public and hopefully I'm hoping to meet them at ASSR this year uh, also and see. And then that really, that's, I think, where we lag behind and our corporate partners, our vendors, our uh, companies that we work with should really work on that also because it's time for change. 
move away from PMMA. I know PMMA, all the characteristics are good, but maybe we should just move away and see if we can have something new that we can try. A great point. And when we think of that, you know, that was Lenas and uh, Osteopearl that you were reflecting on. And the good and the bad, you know, that we're still investigating, right, is more physiologic, potentially advantageous in that way to reduce adjacent level fractures. And with the concern that some people have on initial anecdotal use is, does it provide the immediate symptomatic improvement or relief that we've had with PMMA? Yeah. A little bit mixed uh, results so far. So it'll be interesting to tease that out a little bit more. And along those lines, I know you do some work on axial pain for the basilar tubal nerve. Yes. I think all of us do it now, and I think that's a great procedure. I really love it. I've had good success with chronic pain patients, uh, and really it is developing very nicely. And again, it has a special niche subset of patients that it can help. And I'm, I'm glad uh, the company takes real good care of how patients are being selected for this procedure. And I think, I think that's Although it's at times it may feel to some dimensionless that it is kind of hindrance, it just delays the process. But I think I really think that it really helps select the appropriate patient so that you have the best chance of helping the patient rather than getting a patient in who may not be helped by this procedure just for the sake of just doing the procedure. So I'm I'm glad what they're doing about this and how they are handling this is is just very good. Yeah, you make a great point. You know, Josh Hirsch talked about that as well, that if we need to jump in and do a pulmonary thrombectomy, whether you have a lot of experience or not, it's accepted that you should try to save that person's life. But with an elective back pain procedure, you probably should take the time and get as much training as possible. Especially, especially with basic vertebral neural ablation. It's a 100% elective procedure. It's a patient with chronic back pain. They have learned to live with their back pain, although they, whatever medication they are taking or how much it is limiting their lifestyle, but they have kind of sort of gotten away with it and they, they have that as part of their lifestyle. So selecting from that subset of patients who you really feel that you can help, I think is very important. And Intelligent work should be done in patient selection because that will translate better into your successful outcome. My last detailed question for you, you know, you're, you're practically an oncologist. And so, you know, one of the things that comes up frequently now as we think about our non-vascular interventional spine programs is neuromodulation. And, you know, just a patient today, as an example, in my practice, 40-year-old who has metastatic colorectal cancer has tremendous chemo-induced neuropathy that really interrupts therapy. You know, whether we see the data coming out for diabetic neuropathy, it's really incredible both in terms of the symptomatic improvement as well as the paresthesias and neuropathy. Do you have any thoughts about neuromodulation, whether within your practice or with your pain colleagues for your oncology patients? Absolutely. I think I think that's it's something that is very important for our subset of patients, especially of our oncology patients, and it definitely has a role to play in such patients. And as I said, that even though I don't do it personally a whole lot, but I definitely have our pain guys doing it, and I, I, I send them the patients also if I feel like that they are better suited to help the patient. But the other thing that I really think is that all interventionists should venture into, and we are not offering this more to our patients is is pain. And that's that's really something that I'll be making a conscious effort of getting into because being in the tumor boards and all, there is definitely a subset of patients that pretty much everybody has given up on. And and I think giving those patients the pain pump and helping them obviously their last few weeks, months, whatever is left and having, giving them a chance to have a good lifestyle so that where they can spend some quality time with their loved ones 
at that point is is something that definitely can be helped out with with these pain pumps and i feel like that we are not we're not again the non-vascular spine interventionalists are not offering this as much as they should be to our oncology patients and all of us should make a conscious effort that we should be doing more of that it's a great point you know i think as we talked about the osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures and making sure that either we treat it or they get to the right place for osteoporosis. The same is true when we do bone tumor ablation, right? That they might need neuromodulation or endothecal pump. And as you said, with just to circle back to fellowships at the end, the fellows coming out of Doug's program are getting that clinical expertise of which patients have appropriate pain for neuromodulation and which ones need pumps. And it's not something that's very easy to understand from a book. Absolutely. Invaluable experience. That's that's why I said the whole concept of fellowship really molds you into thinking about these processes very fast and very easily. It just comes naturally to you after you have encountered such situations. So in our final moments, any last thoughts? And what is your timeline like for creating this type of fellowship, either directly with yourself or, or helping others? like myself, provide something like that across the country? Definitely. Like, hopefully, hopefully, I'm hoping that in the next one or two years, we will have something started here at Hopkins and uh, we're going to talk with the other guys at ASSR also. And we should be, we should be, as a group, thinking more about it so that we can, we can definitely have more spine interventionalists trained who can go out there. Because remember, like, we talked about augmentation and all, yeah, we we have initially it was so hard when we started this. I remember when we used to go out and sit in the tumor boards and very s- scared tone, we would say, "Yeah, we can do augmentation." And the the moment we opened our mouth to say that, the second question would be, "Okay, where is the literature?" What does the literature say about it? how can you have literature when you have you're not given the opportunity to do it? So we have lived through that time that we really begged that hey let's let's do it. This is something good and we can we can help out the patient. So now we are at a point that there are papers out there. We already know that it is being recognized as one of the modality to treat spinal metastasis. But I feel like. If more and more people do this, we can. St- there's still so much to do in this metastatic world, and what is limiting us is again that uh, numbers, papers, research about it. The more we do it, the better we will get at it, and better it will be recognized as one of the modality that can have. Now we know that we can we can palliate pain. Now I think we are at a point that we have to prove that we can have, we can control the local regional spread of the tumor also with this modality. Papers need to come out now working with SBRT and ablation versus ablation alone. Actually, we, we published that paper of, on microwave local regional control that some of our patients survived two years. So we do have data on that. But I think I think the more people will do it, these are the sorts of papers that need to come out so that we can stand alone as that. Granted, we have to realize that this is a stage four disease. Nobody is under the notion that we are going to cure this disease. But still, to prove this modality is really good, you have to prove to the oncologists and surgeons that, hey, this is also a good modality for local region control. Yeah, that's incredible. I think I would like to thank you for you know, all the wonderful publications and research that we all gain from, as well as your industry education, as well as your uh, willingness to let people travel and visit and, and shadow you. No, Dana, thank you. Thank you for what you are doing, really. As I said, I'm in a very protected environment, but honestly, I admire you in pride practices, the way you are, you're doing things, the procedures you're offering to the patients in, in your practice. That is really incredible. And as I said, I wish I was doing what you do and offering all the gamut of the things that you're, you're offering to the patient, but that's something that I can do. 
in a way, you are working in private practice world, and I'm doing what I'm doing in an in academic world, and we, our worlds have, at some point, you just merged together, and hopefully, as we train more people, be when they go out in private practice or in stay in academia, I just hope that more and more people will do non-vascular spinal interventions and help these patients and do research also and publish their work because just doing cases really honestly doesn't cut it. Unless you write about it, you write about your experience, that's what gets it to the next level. And that I've learned really from our radiation oncology colleagues. They do anything new, they do less work clinically they publish so much on it already. So that's that's the mindset those guys have. They publish a lot and they publish from every aspect of what they have done. And, and I think radiology and uh, particularly interventional radiology procedures and all that, we do a whole lot of procedures that are very complicated, very complex, but somehow we don't write about it. And that, that's not helpful. Right. Yes, it is very challenging to present our papers on 23 patients. And so a lot of opportunity for us to collaborate. And, you know, I look forward to seeing you at ASSR and SIR. And, and by the time this is released, I think probably everyone will know there will be a second SIR conference out in the fall, which will be even more procedural based. And I think, you know, you're offering a workshop at ASSR and SIR, but there will be more opportunities because there's just too much for people to cover in half a day. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to meeting you and all our friends at ASSR. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and show notes written by Marvie Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Roy Thanks again and see you next time.